This car is the most honest car you've ever seen. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. My name is JP, and our guest today is Cool Plays Guy Berryman. The influential musician is also director of the famous Road Red magazine, designer of his own brand applied art form, and a true car enthusiast. He carries not only music in his heart, also the sound of a vintage car puts a huge smile on his face. With no further ado, welcome Guy Berryman. Guy, where do we find you today? Oh, well, I'm at home. Uh, I'm at home in the Cotswolds. After just watching the, uh, the Grand Prix, um, we have a new world champion. A new world champion. And I th assume there was some celebration, at least 50% of the Berryman household. Uh, well, my partner Kesha is Dutch, so um, she, she was actually crying. <laughs> you know, it was so dramatic and I just don't think, you know, anyone could have predicted it would have come down to such a close last lap battle. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, this, I, I think what we witnessed really was once in a lifetime kind of championship finale. Once in a lifetime, indeed. The battle between Hamilton and Verstappen was just epic. And seeing this fight in the championship 2021 reminded me about the good old days of Formula One. To be honest, I was not following the modern races so far, but this was an epic race. Yeah. Nevertheless, I'd like to talk about you, Guy. In German, we have a nice word that would describe you best. It's the German word is Tausendsasser. Okay. That means a man of many interests and many hobbies yes. and many activities. It's true. So it's a good word. Ta Tausendsasser. No, no, Hasser would be a negative one because that's be a hater. Tausendsasser. Okay. <laughs> is just thousand, like a thousand, a thousand things. And Sasa is not sassy. It's uh, more like someone who's always active, like, you know, doing a lot. A lot well, of I think it's true. I, th I think it's true. I do spin a lot of plates. You know, I'm very passionate about many different things in life, mostly in kind of creative spheres. Um, I've never felt the need to kind of just sit in one box, so to speak. So... When I went to university 25 years ago, I was studying mechanical engineering and architecture. And that's where I met, you know, the rest of my band members. Um, you know, as a teenager, I was always hugely passionate about music and learning instruments. And I really wanted to become a bass player. But of course, when you go to university, you, you know, you have this idea, you might find some like-minded friends to form a band with, but you know, it's kind of, that falls down to some kind of luck of the draw as to whether you meet people and, and, and then whether you you can go on to form a successful group. So, you know, my kind of formal discipline, educational, you know, training was engineering and architecture. And a lot of the other things that I do now around music really tie into those kind of early interests. Absolutely. You know, I think we need to sum it up. Not that you a father Not that you're only a musician, you are a fashion designer, publisher, car collector, passionate about cars. So how do you get everything rolling? It's a juggling act. Time, you know, I could really do with 48 hours in a day to keep on top of everything. But, you know, if I'm away touring with the band and we've been doing quite a lot of promotional trips for our, um, you know, we released an album a few months ago and we've been doing a lot of trips abroad. And you find yourself with a lot of downtime on these trips. So there's plenty of time to kind of keep in contact with, you know, Mikey at the Road Rat. So we kind of push forward the magazine remotely. And, you know, my design studio for the fashion label Applied Art Forms is based in Amsterdam. And, you know, we launched the brand in the midst of the pandemic. So we very quickly had to learn how to work remotely. So I do spend a lot of my time communicating with people remotely to keep everything moving forward but you know everything's coming from a place of passion so you just find a way to make it all work that's for sure and to be honest uh, we have lots of horrible things connected to the pandemic but one little positive outcome is that we learned to work remotely and doing stuff remotely i agree 
And you described your studies of mechanical engineering. Was this in Scotland? I was studying in London. I went to uh, University College London to study mechanical engineering. And that's where I met the band. You know, we all we, we were all basically living together in uh, student halls of residence in central London. Fantastic. Well, I think that's what everyone's dreaming about, right? Having his university band and then uh, making this a dream come true. Yeah. I think we were all quite passionate musicians. Uh, we all came to university with a hope that we would meet other musicians to form a band with. We worked hard and we got lucky, you know, and you need all of those things, I think, especially in this day and age when I think it's even harder to kind of get traction as a new musical artist. You know, we were very fortunate that all of those stars aligned and we met each other and, and things happened the way they happened. And are you the only car crazy guy in the group? Uh, yes, yeah, sadly I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> so nothing to exchange with? No, I think, you know, my passion for cars really began when I was a small child, still living in Scotland. I was born in Scotland and I lived there till the age of 12. And my father is a mechanical engineer. And in our garage at home, he always had his kind of pride and joy, which was a, a Triumph TR3A. And ever since I was a child growing up, it was in the garage up on bricks with kind of tarpaulins over the top of it. And over the years, it got covered in boxes and, you know, you, you couldn't really see any of it. But as a small child, I used to go in and lift up the corner of the tarpaulin and just kind of look at this very exotic shaped, you know, front fender. And uh, I was always chastising him to restore it because I just felt so sad for this car that he bought this. He, he bought the car when he was in his early 20s. Oh, really? And I just always felt so sad that, you know, he was never getting around to doing it up. So actually, relatively recently, I would say in the last 10 years or so, I finally said to him, look, Dad, you're never going to get around to doing this car up. You've got to just find the best Triumph TR3A restorer you can find, and I will pay for it to be done because I want to see you driving this thing. And so he did, and it was restored, and I believe it to be the most expensive <laughs> TR3A in the world in existence. <laughs> But I remember, I think, when was it? When was the first TKC where we met? I think it was the first issue of Road Red, wasn't it? Or the second yeah, one with Hamilton on the, on the cover came out. Yes, I think it was a while ago. Yeah, and uh, Rupert was... Your, your Rupert, father. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, you've met my dad. Yes, we spoke about this. And, you know, he was sitting in your... What do you have? To, I think you took the Zagato, no? Yes, I brought, I brought along a little Porsche Speedster Zagato on that particular trip. And my dad was my... Uh, my co-pilot that day. And he was so happy to doing this together with you. He was smiling from the one side to the other side of the face. And he was telling me about the TR3, actually. Yeah, well, he was just very happy to be there. He's a huge fan of Anthony Bamford, and he believes he's doing great things for British engineering, which I believe he is. And um, he and Anthony are in quite regular communication now. My dad shares lots of ideas with him, and he's always so generous and writing back to my dad and always <laughs> puts a huge smile on his face. Nice. This is how you can understand this passion for cars. It's not about the cars as a center and centerfold. It's more about the people around it. And that's really what I like. Yeah. I think certainly part of the emphasis of my magazine is to celebrate the human stories behind cars. I think a car in isolation is quite a boring thing, really. But the stories about how it you know, came into being is what fascinates me. I think my interest in cars really comes from the fact that it combines so many disciplines I'm interested in into one object. You know, cars are, of course, engineering with the, you know, with the engine and the drivetrains and interesting suspensions. And I think the kind of cars that we're particularly interested in are these kind of mid-century cars, which to me are just like masterpieces of sculpture. So, you know, there's so many things to love about cars. It is. And the stories behind it, that's also what at Classic Driver interests us, right? It's, again, as you said, the people and story. And, uh, you know, I just look into my shelf, which I have in my kitchen, where my dearest books and magazines are. And uh, it's just Road Red, the 917 edition. I think it was the perfect example of how motor journalism slash entertaining education should look like. For me, it was one of the masterpieces of journalism in that sense, and also giving it so much space. Incredible. But I would like to jump a bit 
back in your own personal car history. So your first car was definitely not the, your father's car stored back in the garage, now restored without question in a perfectly manner. What was your first very own car? You know, strangely, I didn't start driving until I was in my early 20s. Really? Um, yeah, um, <laughs> because, you know, I was learning to drive when I was living down in Kent when I was at school uh, and I failed my driving test. And then I went Why? to university. It's quite embarrassing, really. I, 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 I was, totally open. It's just you and me. Well, it was very unfortunate. I was driving out of the test center at the beginning of the test and, um, and the exit was on a slight camber. And um, I stopped on a kind of an, an upwards camber and um, I didn't use the handbrake when I went to pull away and the car rolled backwards a little bit. And uh, unfortunately, there was a car behind me and I, <laughs> and I hit the car behind me. So technically, I'd failed my test before I'd even left the, uh, the, test, <laughs> the test center. So, you know, I'm embarrassed to say my, uh, my driving skills uh, were not great when I learned to drive. So I failed. And then I went to university. And of course, when you're in London, you don't really need a car when you're a student. And then, and then I just finally realized I needed to, you know, get my license a bit later on. And the first car I bought was, um, was a Mini, and one of the new Minis. Oh, good decision, though. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. And then the second car I bought was, and this was still in my early 20s, I went from a Mini very quickly to a, an Aston V8 Vantage mm. 2006 <laughs> model. And then about a month later, I bought four GT. So I, so I passed my test. And within a few months, I was, I was driving around in a four GT. You have to cope up with the other guys, right? So that yeah. was the reason why you'd go to fast lane. You have to keep up. So I moved very quickly into fast cars. But I have to say that it was never really me, that mm -hmm. car. I've never really been into kind of modern, you know, performance cars, actually. And so that car didn't stay around long. Really, my passion lies with cars from the 1960s, you know, mm -hmm. particularly European sports cars. Broadly, that's what forms my own personal collection now. Let's speak a bit about that one, because, of course, I remember in 2017, you got brand new. There was a the Citroen SM joining, I think a German car from Göttingen or something like this, if yes. I remember correctly. There was a Bugatti Veyron sitting there also, which yep. I remember. So it's really like, it's a big span from an Zagar to... Uh, little Zagato Porsche to Citroen SM, Bugatti, and lots of other things in between. Porsche 914, yeah. all these kind of things like this. Um, so how would you describe your taste in cars? Well, I think it's, you know, by the way, the Veyron is gone now. We can talk about that a little bit because, you know, that was a car that I bought not because I loved it. I bought it because I thought I was being clever. It's a stupid car. I really hate it, actually. <laughs> and... So now that that's gone, you know, my collection is really consisting of European sports cars from the 1960s mm -hmm. because they have the curves, you know, they have the shapes and, you know, they were styled by hand. And I just think cars that are designed in computers nowadays, they kind of all tend to look so generic and with all of these kind of details and inlets and wings. And I just really don't like them. Yeah. Even though there's this good old uh, design follows function thing, and I think design should follow function, but you can design it nicely. And now it's just looking more brutal. And they grew so much, they're so big, it's ridiculous in my opinion. Yeah. You know, certainly a lot of sports cars and supercars and hypercars nowadays, they're designed to look good on Instagram for, you know, 14-year-old boys yeah. who are not the guys that are buying them. So my passion really just falls in that sweet spot of the 1960s. Everything I love is actually kind of coming from that era, this kind of mid-century era, whether it be furniture design or music or cars or architecture. I just kind of really resonate with that style of design, that period of design. I know you're really into learning all about these decades. I remember when we sat over coffee in your kitchen You spoke about how much time you spend on researching cars you own or you want to buy. Where does this passion for research come from? You know, a lot of my cars I've sourced from strange places. I, I like to buy cars as projects and restore them myself so I can make sure they've been done properly. You know, I'm very nervous about buying a restored car because you don't know who's done it. It's shiny on the surface, but, you know, it's, it's hiding some pretty nasty things underneath and so forth. So I tend to buy cars which are super interesting, super rare cars in need of full restoration. 
And part of my process is doing this kind of, you know, kind of historical research. At the end of it, I have a restored car with a full history file with all of the previous owners documented. And I'll quite often get in touch with some previous owners and quite often find old pictures of the car from when they owned it and put it together all in one box. So I feel like I'm doing the car a service by putting everything about it back into one place and preserving that you know, not only the car, but the car's history for future generations, because, you know, we are just custodians of these things, you know, they are going to get passed on to other people. And that's always been a, you know, a hugely enjoyable part of the process for me. I mean, I've even found previous owners of some of my cars that maybe sold the car 50 years ago or something Mm -hmm. and haven't even thought about it since they sold it. Yeah. I've got in touch with them and they said, Oh, I think I've still got a door handle. And I'm like, ah, cool, because I'm missing it. <laughs> you know, so this part of the car gets reunited with the car 50 years after it kind of been taken off. Yeah, my experience is they're also like super excited about this because sometimes they sold a car because there was a need for selling because a new kid coming or whatever, or they they moving and then they have so good memories. But I listen often to like stories, you know, I met my wife in that car. She was not the last, but she was the best, right? So yeah. I'm not sure if you would ever meet your wife in the car, but maybe something else. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> so if all cars need to go, which is the last one which will leave your collection? Uh, it'd have to be the 275 GTB. You know, it's an early car. It's a short nose. It's now in its original color scheme, which was... Um, Verde Pino with an uh, orange interior. Very dramatic 1960s color combination. Sounds like. That would be the last one to go, I think. I'm happy for that decision because this car is my dream car. So yeah. if I could ever afford one, which is not going to happen in my life, but I'm super happy that I have some friends who own them, like you and George and others so uh, i'm uh, from time to time able to drive with them and so it's like this car is just fantastic yeah Um, well it's got everything you know it's ferrari it's a v12 and it's just got a shape to die for it's just the most curvaceous elegant yet aggressive looking car and very nice to drive actually because they aren't all very nice to drive and more and more as i get older i appreciate the cars which are nice to drive rather than just nice to look at yeah agreed Our jury president, Lorenzo, I spoke about this car a lot with him. And he was saying, you know what? But there's one problem with the car. I said, what is the problem? It's one of those cars who were, when they came out, they considered old and no one wanted them. They were not very popular. Right. People was like, oh, no, the new Ferrari. No, the Ferrari looks like an old Ferrari. Because there were other things around that time which weren't looking more futuristic. And this one grew so well. Yeah. So it's crazy, you know, that... uh, Now we see this as a design study of Italian car elegance. And when it came out, no one was interested in. Well, it's just the pinnacle of Italian styling, I think. Yes. It's got a slight elegance to it in the way that the 250 GTO doesn't. Yes. But of course, that looks amazing for other reasons. That was a racing car. Yeah. And that's an extraordinary, beautiful car as well, as everybody knows. But I think the 275 is just as nice. Let's speak about Alfa Romeo. Hmm. Is there something in your collection we would like to talk about? Um, Are you talking about the Villa Deste? Yeah, of course. (laughs) Well, I sold it, actually. (laughs) You'll be very disappointed to hear. Um, Yes. I was getting on for about 30 cars in my collection, and it's just, I just felt I was carrying too much. And you can't drive them all. For me, it's one of the most elegant, beautiful cars ever made. And I was very lucky to find it. And it was a complete restoration project. Yeah. It was a huge undertaking to restore that car. Um, and I had to find many specialists in Italy to remake certain parts that were missing. Yeah. It took many, many years to restore that car. So, you know, it's a 1940s car, essentially. I feel much more comfortable with my collection being kind of firmly planted in the 1960s category. Yeah. And the Alfa Romeo has the name Villa Desta. And the Villa Desta is actually a very special place because at the Concorso de Leganza, it was the first time we met. Indeed. Tell us, what were your feelings when you first heard about that you're going to be appointed a judge at Villa Desta? 
Well, I'm always very happy to be asked. And of course, that's a very prestigious one, world renowned, and people ship cars from all over the world to take part in Villa d'Este. And it's beautiful, and I love Como and the lakes, and I have a lot of Italian friends. And so it felt very honored, actually, to be asked to take part in it. So, given the nature of who I am and how obsessive I become about learning things, um, I'm very happy to put my knowledge and my experience to some kind of practical use beyond my own personal restoration. So, and when you'd been there the first time, what were your expectations and was it met? If so, well, I think out of all of the kind of concours events, I think Villa d'Este is the one with the most serious nature, perhaps. Mm -hmm. The judging is taken very seriously. There's rules and there's uniforms and you have to wear a funny hat and a blue blazer and khaki trousers. And, you know, so it feels very formalized, which I was expecting. Um, I just think that we can kind of soften up this whole thing a little bit and uh, approach it in a slightly more lighthearted way. The days can be quite long and quite hard work, and it's difficult sometimes being a member of the uh, the judging team because you sort of look at everyone else having a much more chilled out and relaxed time, having fun, <laughs> and we're working. Exactly. Yeah. So I do quite like just going to the events and not being part of any juries or, or having a, you know any obligations for the day. But you know, it was a fantastic experience. I was very happy to take part in it. And we had this class of supercars in this year is that do you think that's the right direction i don't think there should be any classes of cars which are excluded mm -hmm. you know we have a lot of mark specific events which are great you know i think the luftgekult event is fantastic if you're into porsches and there's all kinds of local club meets where you bring along a specific make of car but i think these big events should really be trying to appeal to a very broad range of society. Yeah. And, and that involves bringing in newer cars into the mix. So cars from the 90s, fantastic. And there's beautiful cars there and fantastic stories there to be told. And even newer cars you know, from the 2000s. I, I think inclusivity should be the direction in which it, all of this travels. Agreed, absolutely. It should be always like a mirror of society at its time. And let's not forget that the concourse events were a presentation of new cars. It was not like we're showing old cars. When yes. it was founded in 1929, it was the show-off of all the coach builders to advertise their cars. So it was always modern cars in it. I think people like you and I, Philip, I think we have a responsibility to fly the flag for car culture and make yeah. sure it keeps moving in the right direction and make sure that new people are allowed access to these events. Yeah. You know, especially now, you know, we're approaching a very interesting time for cars because the end of the combustion era is in sight. Yes. So actually going forward, we can talk about combustion engine cars in a closed context, which I think is going to be very interesting. And it's something we talk about a lot on the road, right? And we're very excited about because there's a full stop coming as we move into electrification. So yes, the story of the combustion engine car is a closed book, which I think makes it a very interesting and fascinating way to keep telling these stories. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, we will have a situation where car events like the Concours event around the world will still happening, uh, where we say, you know, this is the last version of a combustion engine in serial production. <laughs> exactly. Right? And whatever car that's going to be, the last one that rolls off the production line is going to be something that collectors will clamor over. Yes. You know, Absolutely. Maybe, maybe it's a Ford Fiesta or something. I mean, I don't even know if they still make a Fiesta, but... I think they should. Wh whatever car that is, it's going to be a very significant automobile. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm sure. I think they're already planning it. Who will get that prize? Let's speak about the present. Tell us more about Road Red. Why was Road Red needed? Um, it was very interesting to me that if you're into kind of even quite niche subjects, gardening or architecture or wine or collecting certain stamps or very unusual things, you could find a wide array of beautifully produced independent magazines for all of these different subjects. And as a car lover, and I was consuming a lot of automotive magazines from the newsstand, I just felt there was something missing 
from what was being offered, you know, in WH Smith's or these kind of newsstand places. Um, there wasn't a beautiful coffee table magazine for cars and it just didn't make any sense to me or my business partners, Mikey Harvey and John Clayden, who I founded the road rat with. It was just baffling. And so we just felt there was an opportunity to do it. And Mikey came from many, many years of editing Top Gear magazine. He has a, a huge editorial brain, lots of ideas, extremely creative. I have a passion for graphic design and photography. And our other partner, John Clayton, is just a huge car enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, why don't we just give this a go? You know, let's just see if we can pull this together and, and make one and see if people like it. And, uh, and the road rat was born from that quite simple idea, really. Who came up with the name? I think it came from Mikey. And it was derived from something to do with Nicky Lauda. But I can't exactly remember the reason for that. No way. I'll have to get Mikey to fill in the blanks there. But essentially, the name has a link to Nicky Lauda. Nice. Everyone uh, who's listening and have no idea what Road Red is, for me, it looks like an absolutely design and art piece. Every cover looks fantastic. You have special edition covers always very focused on one or two topics in detail and then lots of stuff around it. So would you say that Road Red is a bit also playground for your automotive passion? I think so. Um, the best way I can describe it is a coffee table magazine. So one of the basic rules that we formulated when we were putting it together was it was something that you just would never feel comfortable throwing into the recycling bin. It's a collectible kind of as you say, playground for automotive enthusiasts. And it covers old cars, it covers new cars, it covers design, you know, the history of, you know, Italian coach builders, it's racing, it's engineering, it celebrates automotive photography. We do lots of archival research and present interesting pictures that have never been seen before. Um, issue nine comes out next week and, um, The cover features Honda NSX, and we actually were given access to never-before-seen pictures of the development of the NSX from uh, Ayrton Senna's family. Mega. So we go the extra mile to really present something uh, as best we can. But like I say, it's designed to be something when you engage in it, you want to follow us, be part of the journey, be part of the, the kind of the membership club and just collect them all. You know, this is a fantastic team, and I think Mikey is such a great character, I have to say. So all the guys at Road Red are nice and super enthusiastic about uh, what they're doing. And, you know, if it shows in a nice product, it looks fantastic uh, at the end. But would you say that you use your name also as a door opener sometimes? Does this work still in this world? It can help, for sure. But nothing, nothing's ever a given. Yeah. You know, I've learned that you just have to do things the hard way. And if I'm perfectly honest with you, the road rat has been an extremely difficult challenge. Mm. You know, we're about to launch our ninth edition and they're big magazines, you know, they're sort of 270 pages each, you know, and it's built around nine central features, which are extremely well documented research pieces. And then, of course, we have the beginning of the magazine with smaller sections and the end of the magazine with kind of smaller, more digestible pieces But it's a huge challenge and there's been many a uh, dark moment mm. on the, you know, on the journey. Um, you know, <laughs> just questioning why we're doing this, you know, because publishing is hard, but we're all extremely excited for the future of the magazine. We've got some great plans for the next 12 to 18 months. And I think we'll see the road rat expanding as a brand into different types of content beyond the magazine. Oh, yes. We're all excited to see What will Road Red deliver besides the magazine? But speaking of today and Corona times, we recently all had unusual free time. How did you keep yourself busy? Did you enjoy to spend more time with your cars or in your garage? I must admit I've been very focused for the last 12 or 18 months on building out you know, my fashion label, mm -hmm. um, which again is another extreme challenge, especially in the pandemic, because we make very... It's very high quality clothes, therefore quite expensive. And we launched it when everybody was in lockdown and everybody was worried about their financial situation. Yeah. So to be a new brand selling expensive, beautiful, expensive coats, uh, 
<laughs> it was, it, you know, it was really quite tricky. Um, so I must admit, I haven't been fully engaged with car events. Well, there hasn't really been a car events and, you know, True. for a while. And I do miss them. Uh, before the pandemic, I think I was doing two or three road trips a year. That might have been a two or three day trip up and around the coast of Scotland, or it might have been a trans-European drive from my house down to Italy. Yeah. Uh, seeing friends and meeting people along the way, you know, driving over the Dolomites. And, and I really miss it. So I'm hoping I can carve out some time next year to re-engage with, the, you know, the driving of the cars rather than just looking at them in my garage. Yeah. A beautiful garage, I have to say. But I think cars are made to driven, so that's the idea of it, right? It's true. Um, so road red and also applied art form, which is the fashion brand we were talking about, they are very artistic in a sense. And I really like it if there's a link towards art. And I think we should speak about also this in cars. So we saw lately that Jeff Koons did something on a BMW, which was presented uh, in, in Villa d'Este. But looking mm -hmm. at the art cars of the BMW Group Classic, which when I see them, I really like my heart beats like somewhere between my chin and my head because it's so fantastic to see them. Uh, do you have a favorite art car? Uh, well, it's probably the Warhol. Yeah. A rumor has it that's possibly the most valuable car in the world. I heard that too. I would take that one. If, yeah, if I'm allowed. <laughs> I just saw it recently in Milan standing in the window of Laris Miani, which is like really fantastic. I really like that if yeah. a car brand is so like easygoing saying, yeah, of course we put your car in your showroom, no problem. And I remember the first time I saw the car, I was even allowed to get close to it. There was a pre-program of a Formula One race at, I think, Nürburgring or Hockenheim. I'm not sure which one was it actually, because... I was just getting in and out and I saw this car standing there and I heard so much about it. I wrote so much about it and then seeing it in person, it's a, a brilliant. And you know what guy, what also would be brilliant is if you could provide our listeners with your perfect road trip playlist, because we see this podcast, not only as a podcast, we also would like to see it as a little service provider and you know, Who to ask best for this kind of playlist? Would you do that for us? Okay, I'll make you a playlist. That's fine. That would be fantastic. Yeah, my pleasure. That's very cool. We come to an end now. I think we, we touched all the points that okay. I'd like to touch and talk to you about. And it's always a pleasure having you because uh, it's always inspiring that uh, we see someone who's a true Tausend Zasa. <laughs> and I think the next applied art form should have the word Tausend Sasa on it. And I hope so much that we see us in person very soon. Yeah. I will see I you definitely that. in Berlin because I already got tickets for the concert. Great. Yes, you're coming, aren't you? Yes. I look forward and to that. But we'll see each other before then, Philip, I hope. I hope. Uh, we'll be in London sometime. So thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. It was such a fantastic uh, chat with you. Thank you very much. Guy Berryman. Thank you.